chapter that history may well record as the turning point of this war, racing on the heels of the enemy. The 20th century had already seen its share of world conflict by the time 1962 rolled around and the possibility of another catastrophe that could equate to World War III was far from the minds of the American public as they celebrated Columbus Day on October 9th. After all, World War II, which began in 1939 and ended six years later, and the Cold War, which started two years later, claimed the lives of more than 70 million people and drew sharp distinctions between the Western world and NATO supporters against the communist world. Certainly, Americans could not even fathom the grave danger that was already formulating just a short distance beyond their shores, and a crisis that would send shockwaves around the nation. Though the Cuban Missile Crisis is considered one of the various events of the Cold War, the Berlin blockade in 1948 was considered by many as being the first major crisis of the period. The Soviets, under Stalin's dictatorship, impeded the delivery of goods and supplies to West Berlin in an attempt to virtually starve the people. As a response, the U.S. and several other countries established the Berlin Airlift, which enabled them to furnish essential items to West Berliners via aircraft. Tensions between democratic and communist parties led to the outbreak of other wars, such as the Chinese Civil War in 1949 and Korean War in 1950. Changes in government leadership further exacerbated the situation. Nikita Khrushchev assumed the role of dictator upon the death of Stalin. John F. Kennedy became President of the United States once Eisenhower's term ended, and Fidel Castro overthrew Batista's administration, declaring himself Cuba's new leader. By the beginning of 1961, all relations with Cuba and the United States had been extinguished. As Castro began to align himself with the Soviet government, the U.S. grew increasingly weary with the creation of a communist state in the Western Hemisphere especially one so close to its shores with a distance of only 90 miles from the southern coast of the nation. Cuba also had reason to be concerned about its safety, particularly after the failed CIA Bay of Pigs invasion, in which the objective was to assassinate Castro and overthrow his regime. After the Bay of Pigs, the Cuban government amplified their efforts to build up their arsenal so that they could be better prepared for another possible U.S. attempt to undermine their regime. Castro's alliance to Khrushchev and sudden turn towards communism piqued U.S. interest and measures were implemented to learn the nature of communication between Cuba and the USSR. Messages intercepted from Soviet ships uncovered cargo manifests that were suspiciously blank. Materials unloaded from these vessels at the Mariel ports were done so with utmost secrecy, with items removed at night, completely concealed beneath black canvas and under heavy guard. Cuban pilots were trained in Czechoslovakia by Soviet experts and numerous Soviet ships made trips to Cuba to deliver goods, with over 57 voyages in August alone. CIA surveillance of activities on the island in late August initially revealed locations that possibly contained ballistic missiles. It wasn't until October 14th that these suspicions were confirmed. Navy pilots were instrumental in providing aerial inspections and photographs of missile sites scattered throughout Cuba. This responsibility, nicknamed Project Blue Moon, employed RF-8 Crusaders from Navy Light Photographic Squadron 62 to produce photos that confirmed missile locations in Cuba. Though the presence of missiles posed a serious threat, the photographs captured provided assurance the U.S. was equipped with far more superior nuclear weapons and in larger quantities than those from the Soviets, with a ratio of 17 to 1. However, the fact that the U.S. outranked Soviet missiles was nothing to scoff at. Cuba possessed mid-range and intermediate-range missiles that could easily reach over 1,000 nautical miles within striking distance of our nation's capital, areas in Canada, and as far south as Peru. These munitions were capable of impacting the United States on a grand level, easily killing upwards of 80 million Americans. I have directed that the following initial steps be taken immediately. The government's first response was to send in the U.S. Armed Forces to control the situation with the Navy playing a large role in protecting and defending her country by air and sea. To halt this offensive buildup, a strict quarantine on all offensive military equipment under shipment to Cuba is being initiated. All ships of any kind bound for Cuba, from whatever nation or port, 
Will they found to contain cargoes of offensive weapons be turned back? Once U.S. officials provided evidence of Cuba's intention to the Organization of American States, foreign ministers quickly reached a unanimous decision to support Kennedy's quarantine of the island. The term quarantine was officially adopted instead of blockade and was deemed a non-aggressive measure to gain control over the missile crisis in Cuba. Once the definitive decision was made to proceed with the quarantine on October 22, 1962, it became effective two days later at 10 a.m. The task at hand was not for the faint or those incapable of carrying out superior level performance. Therefore, the solution was simple. The U.S. Navy was adept to successfully carry out this urgent mission and would therefore serve as the first line of defense on the sea. Under the leadership of CNO Admiral George W. Anderson, sailors enforced a quarantine that impeded foreign vessels 800 miles from the Cuban border. Many Navy ships retained influential roles with the overall effectiveness of the quarantine. Some of the vessels include USS Newport News, USS Leary, USS Enterprise, and USS Independence. The Leary assisted the Newport News, serving as her destroyer escort. Both the Leary and the Newport News are credited with intercepting one of the first Soviet vessels attempting to enter Cuba, even after arrangements were already in place to begin the removal of Soviet missiles. As the Lubinsk approached the naval blockade that Friday, November 9th, anticipation levels escalated as crews aboard both ships waited for the Lubinsk response. The carrier successfully stopped the Soviet ship, photographed her contents, and ordered her not to return. Collectively, crews on all vessels inspected approximately 55 Cuba-bound merchant ships during the four-week quarantine and steamed roughly 780,000 miles. Polaris submarines maintained importance in overall success of the mission. Whereas warships could be spotted by enemy forces due to their visibility on the ocean's surface, Polaris submarines were virtually invisible and invulnerable below the depths and could position themselves close to enemy lines to deploy the missiles they carried. Supplied with an ASW carrier, two cruisers, 22 destroyers, and two guided missile frigates, Navy crewmen contributed all hands on deck performance and dedication while serving as America's defenders of the seas. Additionally, naval aviators surveyed ships during the blockade to ensure foreign vessels did not transport medium or intermediate range ballistic missiles and IL-28 light bombers to Cuba. With more than 30 flights flown per day and totaling roughly 6 million miles of flight time during the quarantine, the Navy served as America's watchful eyes in the skies. The Cuban Missile Crisis was resolved almost two weeks after it began, officially terminating October 28, 1962, after Premier Khrushchev agreed to remove Soviet missiles from Cuba. Subsequently, the blockade eased on November 20th, after the final Soviet missiles were removed and Cuba no longer posed a threat to the U.S. and neighboring countries. U.S. Navy sailors and air crewmen of over 250 warships, aviation squadrons, and support units were rewarded with the Armed Forces Expeditionary Medal for their outstanding service and commitment to effectively resolving the Cuban Missile Crisis. Admiral Robert Lee Dennison served as the Commander-in-Chief of the Atlantic Fleet in Atlantic Command from February 28, 1960 to April 30, 1963. Admiral Dennison headed the Unified Command during the Cuban Missile Crisis, which consisted of Navy, Army, and Air Force troops. He commanded all naval components involved in tactical operations during the 1962 conflict, a charge for which he was recognized by Kennedy. Of Admiral Dennison's directorship, Kennedy stated, His superb leadership and professional skill were demonstrated by his direction of the military forces assigned to his command. Admiral Dennison has earned the respect, trust, and confidence of the leaders of all United States military services, the leaders of the Organization of American States, and the leaders of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, with consequent improvement in allied solidarity. Admiral George Whalen Anderson served as Chief of Naval Operations from August 1, 1961 to August 1, 1963. As decisions were finalized in the White House to enforce a blockade around Cuba, Kennedy was quoted as telling him, Well, Admiral, it looks as though this is up to the Navy. To which he replied, Mr. President, the Navy will not let you down. True to his word, his supervision of the fleet helped to safeguard the Americas from the introduction of additional missiles into Cuba. The President later appointed him as U.S. Ambassador to Portugal as a result of his outstanding service during the Cuban Missile Crisis. 
Commander William B. Ecker and Lieutenant Christopher B. Willoughby III were part of a six-jet squadron that flew VFP-62 aircraft in high-risk, all-or-nothing missions during the height of the missile crisis. The photographs they obtained were crucial in confirming the existence of missiles at more than 19 locations dispersed throughout Cuba. These images served as concrete evidence that Soviet Premier Khrushchev's denial of missiles in Cuba were false and allowed the U.S. time to develop measures that ensured the swift removal of weapons from the island. Both Ecker and Willoughby were awarded the Distinguished Flying Cross and Presidential Unit Citation by President Kennedy three months after the crisis ended. Additionally, the President sent each one a letter of gratitude, commending them for contributing to the security of the United States in the most important and significant way. The U.S. Navy has provided exceptional service to the U.S. and beyond. Since its inception on October 13, 1775, throughout the Cuban Missile Crisis, and even today. As the Navy continues to protect America's skies and seas and support ally nations around the world, it upholds the motto, a global force for good.